ask you for, for joining and also to SBRI for co-hosting this and to Lizzle for producing the webinar. Um, so the aim of this webinar is to share experiences of adhering to feminist principles while conducting research, research during COVID-19 lockdown and lessons for a post-COVID post world. Um, so I'll go over our agenda for today. So we'll have the opening welcome, which I just did. Um, we'll also be doing a Mentimeter, um, just kind of to set the tone. Um, I'll pass over to Lizzle who will introduce the panel. Then we'll have the panel discussion, um, some space for Q&A um, for questions from the audience, and then we'll discuss some next steps. So throughout the panel discussions, you're all welcome to share any questions you have for the panelists via the chat box. So I'll pass over to Lizzle from SVR right now. Thanks, Zee. Um, I'm Liz Dartnell. I'm the Executive Director of the Sexual Violence Research Initiative, and we are super happy to be co-hosting this webinar with COFEM. And we have an incredible agenda um, and a fantastic panel just to talk about the doing research um, and doing feminist research during COVID-19. So it's going to be really fun and really interesting. But before we start the panel discussion, um, we would really like your thoughts on what feminist research means to you. So in the chat, Liesl, I know it's very confusing, Liesl or Liz, but Liesl will kindly pay, paste a link in the chat to a Mentimeter. A Mentimeter is sort of an online tool for those of you who don't know, but probably you all do because we're all online all the time at the moment. And throughout the, the hour that we're together, um, please could you write just one word that describes what what feminist informed research looks like to you? So just one word that sort of says, resonates with you about what feminist informed research looks like. And um, at the end, Z will show you us the image of the words that describe feminist informed research. And um, so that is what we're going to do. And so the next step is, I have the great honor to introduce you to the wonderful panel that we have. So yeah, next slide, please. The, um, that we have for you today. And these are all experts in the field that are really grappling with the ethics and the methodological challenges of doing research on violence against women during COVID, whilst at the same time holding really dear the feminist principles that we care so deeply about. So first I wanna introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Chichi Undi. I don't know, Chichi, if you have your video on because I can't see, but if you are, just give us a wave. Chichi's from the Population Council in Kenya. And of course, we are so lucky to have her also as ESFRA as board chair, as well as a member of the ESFRA Leadership Council. Chichi and her colleagues at the Population Council have been reflecting on opportunities for doing research on GBV during COVID, as well as a whole number of issues around discussing the issues around taking care of the research team whilst doing research during a pandemic. Um, and we feel was the perfect choice to be chairing this panel. So thank you so much, Chi Chi, for joining us. And Lisa, would you mind just sharing um, one of Chi Chi's blogs on this topic with the folk in the participants so that if they have much time, they can read those blogs afterwards. We also have Dr. Annie Hevers, um, who is a technical specialist for the SRI and UNDP. Um, in bringing feminist approaches to violence against women and violence against children research, capacity strengthening and intervention development. And Nick has recently co-authored a paper on capacity strengthening for research during COVID. And again, we're going to share a link um, uh, on that resource in the chat. So you're welcome to have a look at that and read it afterwards. But we'll also share all the resources that we're sharing with you via email afterwards. We're also really, really excited to have Sylvia Namakula and Agnes Grace Nobacha um, from Healing and Resilience After Trauma Heart. Um, it's an NGO based in Uganda, who's dedicated to doing holistic healing among women and girls who have experienced human trafficking and GBV. Sylvia and Agnes have done some really thoughtful work around how to do research on you know, really sensitive issues um, during this time. And they've done some really um, great work in trauma-informed phone interviews on sensitive to topics, including working with women who have been sexually trafficked and are just really insightful, thoughtful people. And so thank you, Agnes and Sylvia, for joining us. And Lisa, would you mind sharing their blog as well? Um, 
on the work that they've been doing. There's been so much interesting learnings from that. And just Sylvia and Agnes, just so you know that that blog has been really well shared and um, read <laughs> since it's been put up. So thank you very much for doing that. I'm also really excited to introduce Professor Heidi Stochel from London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, Heidi is also an SVR Leadership Council member, a new, one of our newer members, and so welcome Heidi to both this webinar and to the SVR Leadership Council. We're really excited to have you. But for those of you who don't know Heidi, um, she's a Professor of Social Epidemiology and the Director of the Gender Violence and Health Centre at London School and have been doing research on IPV during COVID, has some really interesting learnings to share with us. And Heidi was just recently talking about the use of phone interviews during COVID, and you can read more on the link that's in, that Liesl again will share in the, in the chat. And then finally, we're super pleased that Lujine Fatal, the research manager um, in Lebanon at Care International can join us on this panel. So welcome Lujine, it's so nice to have you. Lujine's highly respected researcher in the field and has participated in multiple events on the gendered impact of COVID. And um, in particular, I'd like to share a podcast on Empowered Aid in which Lujine talks about how to create or adapt um, aid delivery models that actively work to reduce power disparities and give women and girls a sustained voice in how aid is being delivered. Again, um, Lisa, would you mind sharing that? So, we have an incredible panel. It's going to be such an exciting conversation. And I'm going to hand now over to Chi Chi um, and we'll turn the slides off so we can see everybody's faces. I'm going to hand over to Chi Chi to, to run this incredible panel. So over to you, Chi Chi. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone, and hello. Um, and I'm particularly excited and honored to be uh, moderating this panel. Uh, made up of um, all of these extremely interesting um, female researchers. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion over the next half hour. And I'd actually like to have us start off um, with a question for Anik. Um, and Anik, our question for you is, um, what feminist principles are core to your research, if you don't mind um, speaking a little bit from your personal experience? Thank you, Chi Chi, um, and thank you everyone for bringing this uh, webinar together and for joining us for this conversation today. For us, I'll, I'll speak for myself and, and a little bit um, from SVRI's perspective, um, but I think feminist principles are really important um, in what we research, how we research it, where we do the research, and with whom we engage in, in research. And and it's really something that is um, for us at, at SRI and with all of our partners that we continuously reflect on and ensure that it's something that we don't just talk about and write about, but it's something that we actually do and, and put into action. Um, and that it permeates really all that we do and how we interact with one another and with our stakeholders and partners. So for us at SRI, feminist research, and I'm just gonna uh, use a quote here and then, and then talk a little bit more um, about how we put that into action. But it's research that is collaborative, that works across fields, and that explores and challenges power imbalances that exist both in research and in society. That it is intersectional and provides new knowledge that's grounded in women's realities and strives to achieve structural change. So we really, I think, want to ensure that the research and research processes are not extractive or exclusive, but rather are more about centering respect, inclusivity, co-creation and partnerships, that there's not one knowledge holder or a pen holder in the research process, um, and that different kinds of knowledge are respected and amplified. Um, so that we can really get a nuanced and multifaceted view of quite complex issues. Um, and to ensure that we really center women's experiences and women's voices, um, both in, in what they've experienced, but also in, in creating solutions. Um, and how we define whether or not solutions are effective. Um, and we really think it's important to be cognizant of our own privilege, our own power, our own bias, 
um, and how that may influence the research process because we're re acutely aware that none of us are really can be independent neutral observers and trying to be or pretending that we are is um, can be really problematic. Um, and then also what we think is strongly feminist is making sure that care, kindness and support um, are central to what we do and how we do it. So care, kindness and support for ourselves, for the whole team um, and people who are undertaking the research, but also those that we interact with in conducting the research and disseminating the research. Um, and obviously this making sure that the research that we do is not just done for the sake of doing research or creating knowledge, but that that really is tied directly into um, improving policies, programs, um, and at the, ultimately to improve the lives of women and girls or to um, drive structural changes that will improve the everyday lives of women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Anik, um, for laying that out for us um, so comprehensively. I think it will be interesting to see what our Mentimeter results um, show and uh, how many of the really important terms you've used, um, sort of or concepts you've used, uh, come up in that. Um, because of time, if I, if I could just turn our attention now to uh, Sylvia and Agnes from Heart. Um, Sylvia will speak first, if you don't mind, followed by Agnes. Um, why are feminist research principles, such as the ones that Anik have described, why would you say they are important for research affected by the COVID-19 pandemic in particular? If you don't mind uh, going first, Sylvia, thank you. Thank you so much. I really think that are important because at one, for the process we conduct the research, we should take into account the needs of the participants that are involved. Yes, we need the data from these people, but are they safe? As we conduct this research, are we mindful of their safety? When we talk about the protection of the participants, we are looking at issues like their safety, their safety meaning the environment within which we are conducting the research, that is my environment as a researcher and their environment as the participants. Uh, is it private enough? Can they be, is it possible for them to share the information that they want to share with me? Like, is, it, is there anyone that can listen in and then be, it becomes uh, dangerous for them? So the feminist principles actually guide us researchers to ensure that as we conduct the research, we, we take the protection of the participants to be high priority. Because uh, we also look at the issues of confidentiality. Because when we talk about uh, mutual respect as a, a principle, as a feminist principle in conducting research, mutual respect, that means that I, as a, as a researcher, it is my obligation to ensure that I maintain confidentiality for the issues that are uh, raised within our discussion with the participants. And then the other issue is about uh, ensuring that the environment within which the participant is sharing the information with me is private enough. There are no, it does not like my interview or my engagement with the participant is not putting her at risk. So that at the end of the day, it's not about me conducting my data and I move away, but I'm also aiming at improving and protecting the lives of the women and children that I am working with. The other issue is about um, empowering the participants. Because uh, within the feminist principles, we ensure that um, the participants, as we engage them, we give them the knowledge. We put them in a position where they can freely, all independently participate in research without being coerced. This is done through the rapport that we build before we conduct the research. We take them through rapport. We can, some people use the consenting process as, a, as the time to build rapport help them understand the study that they are participating in, and then also give them an opportunity to either agree or to disagree to participate in the research. 
So for me, there are two main principles, the two main things that are, are important from the feminist principles are the issues of protection and the issues of empowering the participants so that they can ably share with me the information that they have. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. So um, protection, empowerment, uh, all very important principles. Um, I, I'd just like to ask Agnes if um, you have um, other thoughts on this same question based on your experience uh, working um, at heart. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to say something about this. What I can say is that uh, the feminist principles are really, they aim at empowering the women and girls. And if we look at the participants that we had in the heart, they were already disempowered because these were survivors of, tra of uh, trafficking and some to gender-based violence. But then when we look at the feminist principles, I would say, there's, um, there's where we have to uphold and look at, at the respondents as subjects, but not objects of our work. So considering that as researchers, we really had, have to make sure that we involve the participants, especially in decision-making. I think it will go a little bit to what Sylvia has said on informed consent. We give them the information, especially around the privacy, around how they can help in upholding confidentiality, around uh, uh, looking for the spaces where they need to sit in order to be able to freely share so that we can collect valid and uh, truthful information, which is both relevant and uh, accurate and helpful for the study, as well as uh, in getting agency for the participants. So I really feel that um, for any research, especially research that has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really very key for us to look at uh, the participants as subjects of, our, subjects of our work, but not objects. And also I could say something more about the freedom of choice Usually with such um, a category of people, they feel they have no choice. They cannot make a choice on what, what, on what to do, when to have the interviews, and then uh, maybe to opt out. Sometimes they really feel that I need to be in the interview, but they do. But uh, focusing more on the freedom of choice and autonomy would really help um, as a researcher to make sure that the participant also has understood that they have the choice, they have the freedom to opt out at whatever time, especially regarding whatever circumstance that is surrounding them in their environment. Someone has come in and it's a breach of confidentiality. They can speak out and ably say that this and this is going to affect the quality of our interview. So maybe let's pause or let's come back to it a little bit later. Thank you. And thank you, um, Agnes, um, for, you know, emphasizing the or underscoring the point that um, <clears throat> those that we collect data from are certainly not objects. Um, some would even uh, go so far as uh, to refer to um, to refer to those that we collect data from as participants or and, or as collaborators even. Um, so thanks for reminding us of that. Um, and so still speaking about feminist principles, I would like to uh, bring Heidi into the conversation. Um, hi, Heidi, I just wanted to ask in what ways you would say that feminist principles have guided the adaptations that you've made um, to research methods? Thanks so much. And um, first of all, I'm very glad what Sylvia and um, Agnes just talked about because it literally is the same that I might give, you know, some more concrete examples on about right now. I might not have used exactly the same term, but I think the underlying idea really is the same. But thanks a lot to the two of you. Um, just really briefly, because not that much is yet known about our study because it's not yet published, is that we've conducted phone interviews with women in Tanzania on the experience of violence, economic well-being and livelihoods um, during the COVID restrictions in Tanzania. 
what is specific about our study, and that's quite important to put it into context, is that we already interviewed these women three times face to face. So they knew us, they knew the research team, and they had a lot of trust that was built up before that. And trust, it's really important. They knew that we would deal with the uh, information really confidentially. They knew the interviewers, they knew the institution that's behind it. And I think that was quite crucial for um, getting 92% of the women actually on the phone and doing the interview with us. So what the really guiding principles for us were um, very high and paramount was safety and well-being of our participants and our staff. And I just want to give a few examples and it's not holistic. But in terms of participants, obviously, as Sylvia said, like their safety, who's overhearing that? Are they safe in you know, doing these interviews? Is anyone kind of listening in to that? So we did a lot of training with our interviewers to even at the consent stage and an informed um, consent stage, and they gave additional consent for these phone interviews to make sure that, is this a good time for you to talk? And we actually scheduled interview times, most of them. So again, our women kind of knew that we take this very, um, you know, this is very important to us and to them, and they knew that it's likely to be questions about violence, private questions. Um, so that we didn't actually have any interruptions or many of them. And if it was, then, you know, the women said, it's okay to talk now, they left, or it was just the neighbors and so on. But our interviews were also like really tuned in to say, oh, I hear this noise, is everything fine? Can you still talk? Um, so we did a lot of, you know, training around that. Obviously, still, you have to ask yourself, is referral possible? In our case, it was possible because Tanzania was only under restrictions, not under complete lockdown. So we were still able to refer to women, refer women to services and follow up with them whether the services worked for them or not. The other thing, obviously, is if, if women become upset during the time, I think Agnes mentioned as well, you know, saying, do you need some more time, etc., being... Obviously, that's much harder because you only hear their voice. You don't have the other visual cues that you normally have. So that was also one of the big worries for the team and the training. The really good thing was the length of the interview. The participants really quite liked that. And just in terms of other feedback we got from participants before I move on the staff, or what we observed is that in some ways, women were able to have safer interviews because they now took them in the bedroom. They normally would not ask the interviewer to do the interview in the bedroom with them. They would sit outside under a tree or you know another room where it's actually much easier to interrupt it but because they knew that we're in the bedroom they didn't have that many interruptions and also they said actually none of these neighbors came over and said like oh who's there you know people curious if there's you know someone from outside you know their, their neighborhood there so in some ways the women quite good feedback around that in terms of privacy um and more confidentiality and they really like the fact that there were you know less time constraints the interviews were shorter than the face-to-face -face interviews and it was easier to time it for them as well because our interviews were in time um there were less issues around that they could do them at more awkward hours as, as well because no one needed to drive to them and i think what agnes also said in the end really this thing about Having the power to control the interview was much more given to the interviewee. And even though we as researchers might not 100% like it, it's a really good thing that some of, like, especially in the qualitative interviews, women were, you know, they, they were, you know, they, they, they found it easier to say, no, I, I don't want to tell you more. They, it was easier for them to say, like, I don't have anything else to tell you than if you are face to face and you kind of have to, you know, meet a certain standard of, being polite. Um, so that I think is a really good empowering thing to, to keep in mind um, that sometimes you couldn't dig as hard as you want, but it's probably good. Um, but then the other really important thing we found is around staff and you know what is the safety and well-being for our staff. So obviously safety was slightly higher because our staff didn't have to travel to the women's neighborhoods, which in our setting wasn't always completely safe. There might be you know, drunken neighbors around, or they just had to walk very long on their own, this, you know, so that kind of all fell, um, fell flat. But then, you know, that was the main safety thing. It was more the kind of comfort they, they valued of, you know, being on the phone, you don't have to look so much about your appearance and how you are. Um, and you could really focus a lot more on the phone call. But because we, we were really worried about participants safety and how our interviews felt so we had daily feedback sessions and then weekly sessions and that also included me 
And what came up because we had this session very often that one of the staff members also really complained that she had hearing problems through the phone and the quality of the phones. So I think that's something she might not have felt comfortable to say if you don't have a really regular feedback rounds with, with them. And, and she's definitely someone who prefers to have face-to-face -face interviews. So I think you, that's, that's quite important kind of, um, you know, giving your staff the, this time actually to really reflect on how these interviews affect them. And obviously still hearing stories of violence on the phone is quite important. Even for the survey, we felt it was quite important to give women enough time to not just say yes or no, but if they say yes, to actually have the time to also talk about their story a little bit. And it's not just this, you know, quantitative yes, no, yes, no, but actually if they say yes and want to share more, give them some time and space. So really thinking about that. So I think um, this is really on the feminist kind of um, piece, but we also, just as a background, we trained our interviewers for three weeks to do these phone interviews and they were already trained on GBV. So we didn't need to train them on that. It was just about really practicing these phone interviews, different case scenarios, thinking about all the worries that they have. And our interviewers were quite worried about the phone interviews. They didn't think it would work. So it was really like talking through everything that could happen so that they felt, yeah, now I'm trained, now I'm fine. And before the interviews, they always said, you know, you need to mentally prepare yourself for phone interviews. You know, 10 minutes before that, get into the scene, have a good room that has privacy as well on, on their end. And I think that was quite crucial. So really, you know, it, it does take resources. I think that's quite important to do it well, to have the right technology, to have these backups and then not rush them either. Um, I think that's my main kind of lesson or story. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, thank you for that story, Heidi. Um, I mean, I think three weeks of training is impressive. It's also really necessary. It really is a whole new skill set, if you think about it, for um, perhaps oftentimes we're relying on the same um, cohort of researchers or data collectors because they have been trained in GBV. We already know that they're sensitive and, and have the skills. And so um, sort of learning how to do interviews all over again um, without being face-to-face, -face, I think, um, it's something that really requires the time that you, you've invested. So thanks a lot for, for sharing all of that. Um, I did want to ask uh, Lujine um, uh, another important question, because if you think about it, we actually need feminist principles much more than ever that, um, in times of crisis. Uh, but what you find is that these principles get thrown out during a crisis, oftentimes when they're supposed to be more important. Why do you think that is, Lujine, if you don't mind speaking to that? Hi, Chichi, and hi, everyone. Uh, yes, I totally agree. Like in a global crisis, there's a huge risk of becoming gender blind because I believe like because we tend to focus on like short term needs uh, response, like the response to our short term needs rather than our rights based approaches and responses that we use. Uh, as you guys know, like in Lebanon, we have the economy plunged into financial crisis. Uh, we have a uh, government imposing a lockdown to counter uh, to counter COVID-19. And also on August 4th, we had a massive explosion, destroying much of the port and severely damaging uh, people and buildings all over Beirut. So we, we have like the pandemic and we have additional uh, political and economical crisis in Lebanon. So I feel like now more than ever, we should uh, ensure that we reach out and we make sure that we're asking about women and women's rights, uh, rights in Lebanon. We need to reflect and we, we need to be louder about the importance of working with feminist principles at uh, during times of global crisis. So for example, uh, with the onset of COVID-19 in terms of our project, uh, phase two, which was implementation science was adapted not only to test out recommendations from women and girls uh, in phase one, but we wanted to also understand how this COVID-19 pandemic and how the crisis overall in Lebanon in terms of politically and economically affected their access to services, whether it, they be SCA or other forms of services, to information and their knowledge about uh, reporting and the complaints mechanisms, etc. Uh, within the changing context of this pandemic, at a time where refugees have li had little other avenues for communicating, this information with aid actors. So we need to be, have an open and honest conversation about, about how the impact of the crisis 
uh, about the impact of the crisis on the women and as well other excluded and marginalized communities and what this means for women and uh, rights in the longer term. So we want to try to prevent a catastrophe from happening in terms of women's rights and focus on how we can uh, include uh, women in decision making uh, in terms of how to respond to such crisis from A to Z. Thank you very much, um, Lu Jean, and for everyone on the panel for um, making it through the initial question. I'd like to throw out a question to the entire panel before I open up um, the floor for questions from the, the audience today. Um, I know that uh, Heidi has touched on this a little bit, but could I ask how you uh, all have supported researchers um, during your studies, um, during this time of COVID-19? In what ways have you supported researchers or data collectors? Would any of you like to speak to that? And it doesn't have to be um, everyone, but anyone who feels like they have um, uh, something in particular to share. Um, so I, from the SRI perspective, one way that we've tried to support researchers is to be flexible um, and to always be caring in the, you know, that caring is the sort of the first response, being, being kind and um, understanding that this is a really difficult situation for everyone on multiple levels. And what is needed now is not a rigid um, sort of take on how to move forward, but to be more flexible um, and to go back to the root of what the principles are, what to, to guide us um, forward and to really come up with solutions together and to draw more people into that conversation and not sort of think, well, it's your problem and you need to come up with a solution, but really that we're all in this together. Thank you, Anik. Yes, Heidi. Oh, just kind of to, to add or to say um, a bit more about something. So one, in, one part of the training is why we didn't talk about GBV very much. Actually, the first session of our training was around COVID and how it affected them and their families. And that was actually quite important um, because they, it was a big burden on, on, on our interviewers' chests in some ways, you know, and also to share around what, what's kind of important for, for them. But then I feel like it was because it was a new technique for them once we started the data collection to really check in very regularly in the beginning, you know, daily about what the experiences were, how they felt with it, and then later not, you know, not that regularly, but at least weekly, if not every two or three days. And we had one team leader who I was in touch with every two days just to know everything that's kind of going on so that there's a very direct feedback loop, but also that they felt um, they are heard and the issues that they had are kind of taken up. Great tips. Um, I do have one more question for the panel, and that's really, um, I mean, thinking post school of COVID now, um, I wonder if uh, any of you would want to briefly talk about how feminist research should be conducted in a post-COVID world, especially given the lessons that you've learned in adapting data collection so far. Any pandemic that happens is a very strong reminder of the impact of the gendered social norms that perpetuate gender inequality. So, uh, now more than ever, we should like increase, uh, uh, like support feminist movements and ensure their participa uh, the participation and responses related co to COVID-19 from A to Z, so that for post-COVID, we can ensure like a, power, a gender powered uh, social life in terms of research, you know? So maybe we should, include like have decision make feminist decision makers and include their participation and engagement and everything from now so that post that we could all like be ready and start in in inequality right thank, thank you for sharing that uh, Lucien. um yes is that agnes please go ahead yes it is uh i think uh for moving forward it would be very important to give some additional support to the participants, mm -hmm. connecting them to some kind of more support. Maybe it could be financial, because what I realized in this uh, crisis, there was um, the, during this crisis, many of the participants were affected differently. 
and that those that had to be integrated back into their communities and they also had more responsibility to carry on their shoulder. So with this additional support, the financial support and also the referral processes, we connected them to other, uh, other qualified or trained personnel to offer more kind of uh, counseling for where they disclosed uh, issues like, uh, to do with suicidal tendencies. So um, I really think that it would be very necessary to also consider that other side of mental well-being and connect it to their context and support them much better. Thank you, uh, Agnes. I appreciate those uh, comments and insights. Um, I would now like to open up uh, the floor for questions and comments. I see a first comment in the chat box from Emma Bell. Emma, would you just like to unmute yourself? Maybe turn your camera on and just pose your question. I think that'll make things even more lively. Please feel free to do so. Yeah, that's a really critical question I see in the chat box. Hi, sorry, I'm in my bedroom. So it's, um, yeah, basically just that it's a, this is a, a piece of research that uh, I worked on with Salamander Trust in Southern and Eastern Africa in the summer looking at the impact of COVID-19 on SRHR and HIV. And we did also work with women within different countries who then went on to interview more women. So we tried to, to bring in that sort of more sort of participatory women-led aspect. Um, but in these interviews, there were at least three women that said they'd already conducted research with their networks, for example, sex workers or drug users or young women about these, their priorities and needs. And so I guess my question is how do we sort of, we often talk about us uh, researching them and, and how, you know, so how do we move from that sort of, um, that sort of way of thinking to supporting more community led approaches. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your turning your camera on. Thank you for that uh, question. Any reactions, whether from the floor or from the panelists um, to that question? I think it's, you know, really, how do we start to embrace, you know, if I'm interpreting it correctly, more of a technical support um, mindset, you know, when outright, you know, going out there into the field to do the data collection ourselves is not necessary. Um, how do we make that shift? Any um, ideas by way of a response? Lujin, do I see you? Yes. Please go ahead. So honestly, I love the idea of moving away from that we research them and support community-led research. What we currently do is that we, do, like from, from our project and Empowered Aid, we do not research women and girls. Women and girls are the researchers of the project. What we do is that like we train them and we use, use particip participatory action research uh, to conduct a data collection. So I feel this is extremely, extremely informative and extremely empowering type of research to conduct with women and girls. No, absolutely. You know, I would definitely agree. Thank you, uh, Lujine. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to respond, but um, yeah, in the meantime, I'm going to just call out Michelle Lockhart. Forgive me, Michelle, but I see you on the call and I know that you have quite a bit of expertise in this area of you know applying feminist principles to research. Um, I'd love to hear any comments you have on what you've heard so far, Michelle. Thanks, Chi Chi. Apologies, I'm outside, so hopefully there's not too much background noise. Not at all, not at all. We can hear you. Yeah, I think it um, it's great to be having these discussions and thinking about practical ways of bringing feminist values and feminist approaches to our work. Um, I think what really struck me as well and what I've been reflecting on is also this concept of research fatigue um, and this idea of sort of multiple organizations going out and collecting data on violence issues and how um, that is not only sort of a problem from a duplication of research perspective, but also um, in terms of the actual fatigue of the community to be constantly be asked about these topics. Um, and so I think also worth for us to think about how we 
um, can coordinate our efforts more around data collection and make sure that we're not just sort of repeating work that has already been done, but also trying to build on existing research and recognizing the times where there might not be a need for data collection because it already exists. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been thinking about, if that is helpful. It is very helpful. You know, we do have to be responsible in that way and ensure we're not reinventing the will, but sort of building upon the will where, where it's necessary. So thank you for sharing that uh, comment, Michelle. Thanks also for your comment in the chat box, Fiona, about a Salamander Trust, um, a live framework that uses um, sort of participatory approaches um, to bring together violence against women and HIV research and action. Um, I, Liz also has a comment. I'm sorry, Liz, but I didn't see your hand up. Please go ahead. No, that's, um, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Chi Chi. Sure. Um, I just wanted to say, it's a really interesting discussion and thanks for the panelists and Chi Chi for facilitating such thoughtful responses. I have two questions. One is to the panel around, um, and Lujin, uh, I think this was your point, around the importance of bringing women's stories and it being community led and being very participatory. And I think the challenge for us as a field is how do we bring that knowledge and those learnings into peer reviewed academic literature as well. So those discussions and the learnings can be part of the main field. Through the SRI, we try to ensure practitioner based knowledge does get into the programs at the forum, but how do we make it much more entrenched and much more normative is one question. To Heidi, Agnes and Sylvia, I have a question around the telephone surveys. It seems like you got quite a great response from the women that you were interviewing. I mean, Heidi, you got a 92% response rate. I, I, is that correct? Like 92. So that's, that's really amazing. And I, I wonder if it's, um, if, there, if there's anybody in the, the group that has had different experience of, of asking women or children or people during COVID through telephones, have the response rates been different? Because I know work in South Africa, they found it very difficult for people to engage around the issues of intimate partner violence or family violence uh, through a telephone interview. But I think that Heidi, Sylvia and Agnes, you may be talking about a different, very different cohort or context as well. So maybe that's why you were more successful. So those are my two questions and comments. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Um, uh, would you like to respond, um, Heidi, and uh, whoever else has mentioned? Sylvia or Agnes, I don't know if you want to go first, one of you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Heidi, since I hear okay. your voice. Uh, okay, good. Um, I think I wanted to um, reflect on what Emma and Michelle has said in terms of our study, because obviously then as soon as I read and heard this, I was like, oh God, are we doing this right? Um, maybe to say, I think there's two kind of immediate thoughts. I mean, we, we do the research with, um, with our local partners in one's intervention trials unit. So at least at that level, you know, it is um, very much driven by the local agenda of the researchers. I'm not sure. 100% about the women, but one thing that did say on the phone is that they're really grateful that we call them, that we haven't forgotten about them. And for me, that's actually not necessarily the COVID survey, but generally doing longitudinal services women, because they, 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 the feedback we get is that they quite like the fact that we call them again and we don't forget about them. But at some point we will. And that's, you know, like maybe it's a bit looking into the future. And in this COVID, they were quite glad that we called them to remember, remind them that COVID is important, how they can keep themselves and their families safe. So in some ways that feedback was positive, but maybe they are not that over-researched as in, in other parts. Um, I think in terms of the response, again, it is linked to the fact that they knew us, they knew what questions we asked, which is why they might have responded. I know of another survey in Mwanza where um, they really struggle to get especially younger women on the phone. And as soon as they knew it's about sexual reproductive health rights, they weren't, they didn't want to continue in the informed consent um, because they didn't have that connection um, before. So that probably just was a really crucial, crucial point. But I see Sylvia is unmuted now, so she might come in. Yes, I'd like Sylvia to come in. And then after that, we're going to move to the chat box where I see um, some equally interesting questions and comments coming up. Um, yes, please go ahead, Sylvia. Thank you, Chi Chi. 
I guess uh, it was the same with uh, the heart study because uh, our participants were involved in a five rounds of planned data collection. So by the time we went for the phone interviews, it was the third time that we were talking to them. So that is why majority of them continue to participate. But um, I really understand that um, many people are finding it difficult to engage people in uh, phone interviews. But for, for other studies, I've had people talk about uh, oversampling and then also building the rapport. I really think that the rapport helps a lot with giving people an opportunity, like you give people an opportunity to get to know about the study, get to know why you, why you want to engage them. That kind of helps with the, with the participation. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, in the time that we have left, I think we can move to a really interesting um, discussion developing in the chat box. I would actually like to call on Fiona to just um, uh, let us know what her comment and question is. Really important question that's come up in another meeting before, and maybe I can talk a little bit about you know what was proposed as the way forward. But please go ahead, Fiona, and then uh, we'll move to Tanya Frame. Thanks so much. Tia. Yeah, it was just this issue about the you know what counts as evidence and who it counts for. So in the study that Emma talked about before it was really important to get the messages out there quickly. It was about COVID. Women were talking about things that were happening to them right now that really are not okay. <laughs> and, and we didn't feel that we could wait to write an article to get it peer reviewed and to do all those things. That might be our priority as researchers or it might not, but it definitely didn't feel like it was the priority. So we got the messages out, they're still getting out, we're circulating them as much as possible and using every opportunity to talk about them as are the, the national researchers and some of the women who were involved and became co-researchers. Um, but I think there is that question of how do you make it count? How do you make it acceptable for some of the, you know, the international agencies who have a lot of um, a lot of the, the responsibility and accountability and resourcing to be addressing this and don't think that this counts as research until it's in a peer reviewed journal article. No, really, really, really important question. Liz, did you, um, did you, you put something in the chat box on that? Um, I think it's a really important, Liz says here, let's think about building a peer review system and advocacy with journals as well. Does anyone have any suggestions or any success stories? I do want to say that what I have noticed is that, you know, one of the things about COVID-19 is that it seems to have made um, blog posts so much more acceptable. And, you know, they really are a quick way of getting things out and they really do seem to be gaining legitimacy. And I'm even finding um, the international agencies citing the blog post because this is what's topical. And, you know, now how long this will last is what we don't know. But what just occurred to me as you were speaking, Fiona, is that um, we need to cite one another. When we see blog posts um, that are, you know, really interesting, informative, useful, I mean, whatever has a citation, can get cited. And I think um, in another feminist meeting that I was in last year, where this topic came up about practitioner knowledge, um, one of the things we realized was that oftentimes is the researchers who are into ensuring that there's a citation on their work, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a brief, whether it's a, and then the practitioners are not necessarily doing that. So we decided to sort of make a rule that when you put out something cited, it doesn't have to be in a journal, people will quote it if they have a reference uh, for doing so. Okay, I've talked too much for a moderator. Let me see what else is in the chat box. Liz, keep me straight. Um, yes, deciding each other, okay. Um, so there was a comment, Chi Chi, from Tonya yeah. about safety. Oh yes, uh, so sorry, Tonya Frame, I did see that. Please, can you go ahead um, and um, uh, would you mind just... Uh, Speaking yeah, out your question, sure. thank you. Sure, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for this um, this platform. Um, it has been quite challenging, I think. Um, and you know, just to get on the point about the blog post for the research that I've 
I'm just sort of wrapping up. I mean, the blog posts were really, really handy to get information about, you know, how do you conduct focus groups and so on online um, because you can't do it in person and all of those. And so I found that I really heavily relied on a lot of the blogs that people were posting rather than the journal articles. Um, but on the issue of safety, you know, the study was with, with young people 16 to 24. Um, and it was really important that during the focus groups at the beginning when we were doing the informed consent, which we did online as well, um, that we asked them about safety. If they were, felt that they were in a safe place where they could have an open conversation um, because we included a lot of marginalized populations. Um, so, you know, it was really, really, really important that we can hear their voices but at the same time, making them feel that they were safe and that they weren't feeling forced um, to participate. Um, and then just the issue of the fatigue, whether it's COVID fatigue or research fatigue, I think that was really, that really affected the participation that we had. You know, it really took a lot of mobilization to get just very small groups of, um, of young people to participate. And I think one of the complaints was this research fatigue and this COVID fatigue. No, thank you for raising that, that issue, um, Tanya. I mean, there, there's just, there are quite a number of different issues that we need to deal with, including the uh, research fatigue issue that you mentioned. Um, I'm conscious of time and I think we only have about two minutes, but just want to say that there seems to be quite a lot of enthusiasm about figuring out how to make blogs more mainstream. They do contain a storehouse of information. People tend to write from the heart and they're not restricted by all kinds of rules where they can really say what they want to say or shape things in the, in the ways that they want to. I do find that oftentimes they're even really rigorous, actually. Um, it's just that they're quite short. Um, and so, you know, there's suggest there are suggestions in the chat box around whether there's a journal that would be open to publishing blogs. I think that's a really radical and exciting idea. And whether blogs should also make clear their peer review process. Um, you know, and perhaps it's a much shorter uh, peer review process, which would encourage more people to, to send things in. We all know how we tend to sit on papers for years because the peer review process is just so annoying, in my opinion, necessary, but annoying. So, you know, um, I think I will sort of leave it at that. Celeste says uh, that Journal of Humanitarian Assistance was open to other formats and quotes. And I think that if we do our homework, for our research, you know, we will find that, you know, there are certain places where um, blog post type uh, uh, write-ups can, um, can be published, I think including commentary sections um, of journals. But I think particularly right now in the time of COVID-19, there does seem to be a little bit of flexibility there um, if we're willing to sort of look out for it. Okay, we have one minute left. Uh, Liz, I think I'm gonna hand over to you. Is that correct? Thank you. You you are correct. And I'm going Thank to you. hand over to Z, who will present the Mentimeter's findings. And thank you everyone for such a great discussion. Yes, amazing. And so many great ideas. Yeah, so we have, I think, intersectional was a really big one. Um, yeah. Transformative, collaborative, accountable. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, those are account accountability, accountable accountability, um, transformative collaboration, engagement, co-creation, ethical, getting answers, decision-making, power dynamics, fair, empowering, freedom. I like freedom. Um, yeah, these are all really, really great. I'm gonna hand over back to Liz to kind of wrap us up and leave us on the screen. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Um, it was so energizing, exciting to hear how colleagues are thinking deep, really thinking deeply around how to ensure our research on GBV, a very sensitive and hard topic during this difficult and challenging times um, can be can remain ethical, participatory and feminist informed using all these beautiful words that are on the screen that we hold deeply. Um, and we really are super excited by the really great discussions around how to bring practice-based knowledge and blogging, et cetera, into mainstream discourse. And so what we think I'm, we will do um, with all your permission is to write um, a blog maybe <laughs> uh, 
about these discussions and the key issues that have been raised and share them with you. And um, that will be one of the next steps. And of course, we'll share the webinar recording with you as well. And finally, I really wanna thank the incredible panel. It's been so wonderful to hear your thoughts and ideas and the great work that you're doing and the solutions that you have um, raised in response to some of the challenges. And I really wanna thank the wonderful panel chair, of course, Chi Chi, it was incredible. And, and, and also we didn't really get to hear some of the most incredible experiences that you have. And so next time maybe you, you, sh you should do a, a, a keynote on these issues. I also wanna thank COFEM and particularly Z. Thank you so much for pulling all this together and for making this fabulous panel happen in such a short time frame. So thank you for that. Thanks to the s staff, for producing and supporting the process. And thank you to all of you for being so engaging, so creative and thoughtful um, and bringing all your ideas and being willing to participate in such a meaningful feminist way. So thank you all. And we look forward to meeting you all online again very, very soon. So thank you so much. Stay in touch with us and we'll be sharing the, the blog with you as um, and you're all now part of the peer review process. So we want your comments and thoughts and we'll say that this is a joint blog developed by folk that participated in this webinar. So thank you, everybody. Go well and stay safe. Thank you.